Okay, guys, so if you're in a Western context, I don't have to tell you there is a stigma around the topic of signs and wonders and the supernatural. Why is that? Uh, the reality is we have a worldview as Westerners that prevents us from openly talking about this in most evangelical settings. So we've got to confront this if we are going to step into accomplishing what Matthew 24, 14 defines as the gospel of the kingdom going to all nations before the end comes and Jesus returns. Highly important we talk about this coming up. Hey there guys, welcome back to the Multiplying Disciples channel. My name is Mark. It's great to be with you on a channel where we dig into practical tools, uh, helpful principles to equip you to multiply disciples, leaders, and churches in every people, passion, place until there is no place left. So if that content is helpful for you, please hit that subscribe button and ring the bell notification so this content ends up in your inbox. So again, with all that done, said, and out of the way, let's jump in. We have been talking about a, a, a somewhat controversial subject, I guess I'm going to highlight in this video. Um, in recent videos here, Signs and Wonders, and this is a part of a, a series I'm engaging in, and it really does have to do with this topic of multiplying disciples, which is the core uh, focus of this channel, um, in that the, 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 the core mission that Jesus has called us to, the Great Commission, is to teach all, uh, to, to, to do all that he's commanded us to do. And, and one of the things that he models in the Gospels is to pray for the sick. So we've got to unpack this topic of uh, signs and wonders and where does it fit. And so in this video, we're going to dig into some of what it, 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 the barriers that we have to address as Westerners to understanding and uh, approaching practically, what do we do with signs and wonders? Theologically, but also uh, practically. So this is going to be a bit of a theological unpacking of why it is that this has such a stigma around it in our Western context. Okay, so as I highlighted in the intro, you know, Jesus said this in Matthew 24, 14, that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. We see Jesus doing this. He goes throughout Galilee, Matthew 4, 23, and he's teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Okay, so when it says this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations, it's not the mess. The message is not the gospel of personal salvation um, or personal freedom from sin. The, the message is that of the king's dominion entering the king's domain. Now, of course, the reign and rule of Jesus has everything to do with our personal salvation. It includes that, uh, but there is uh, more implications to what this actually looks like in both the ministry of Jesus and in what this looks like for us today. So the message of the kingdom is what will have to go to every people, tongue, tribe, and nation. And that's what sets up uh, the, the conditions for the return of Christ. So what is this gospel of the kingdom? All right, so when Jesus began to do his ministry, we see in Luke 4, 18 and 19, him describing uh, what Isaiah in Isaiah 61 uh, proclaimed that that uh, this this anointed one that was coming would do, and he quotes it, and he says, "The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor." Uh, and then he goes on to say, "He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor." Okay, so this is jesus uh really i've heard some uh some theologians or practitioners call this jesus's job description as he's beginning to enter into his ministry he says the spirit of the lord is on me for this task and he, he uh, has anointed me for this task and he defines that task as the proclamation of the gospel to the poor so there's a proclaiming of the message and we see him doing that but then it also includes um, a setting free of prisoners, a recovery of sight for the blind. That's supernatural power. Setting the, free, the oppressed free. That's overcoming demons and the year of the Lord's favor. In other words, uh, things, everything being put to rights. Um, justice coming. So how do we process through this? Um, what is our, is, is our goal to see, um, uh, to see a communistic society or to, to bring about social justice? is that Should that be our target? How do we begin to unpack this? Well, let's uh, dig into this. So part of our challenge of unpacking the, the specific things that Jesus is talking about here in Luke 4, 18 to 19, so putting aside that idea of uh, building a social utopia or that kind of thing, Jesus actually defines specifically his task as, 
And then we see him doing this in the Gospels is to uh, see the, 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 the blind recover their sight, to see demons cast out. So uh, why is this so difficult for us? Well, the reality is we live in a Western context that has been built. I mean, our systems, our way of thinking, our founding fathers, our, everything um, is built on a rational worldview. In fact, the, 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 uh, the government that we have and the, the, the founding fathers emerged from a, a period called the Enlightenment. So uh, there was, the, people talk about there being some of Christianity in there. Really, it was deistic and uh, it was a, comes from a period of enlightenment and they exalted, they prized knowledge. We continue to have that kind of uh, in, in our culture in the, in the U.S. and in the West. Now, some of that's changing right now and that's a topic for another video. But, um, you know, this kind of worldview that we have grown up in, that you and I have grown up in, uh, it either discounts or it minimizes the supernatural. And so this makes it difficult for us to identify with what Jesus says here in Luke 4, 18 and 19 as a model for anyone other than Jesus. We say, hey, that's what Jesus did. But the thing that we have to wrestle with is then Jesus goes on and he doesn't just do that as the son of God, but he actually does that in his humanity. The spirit of the Lord's resting on him. And then he begins to equip other disciples to do the same thing. And he's telling them to go out in Matthew 10, 7 and 8 to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, cleanse the leper. He's telling them to go forth and do those same works. So uh, he actually promises even in the Gospels later that they would do greater works than him. So not only is he telling them to go do these things, but that greater works would be done by his church. So we've got to wrestle with that. And the problem is our Western uh, rational worldview makes that hard for us to do. But we've got to uh, acknowledge that that's there and begin to return to the fact that the worldview of uh, the uh, Near Eastern context in that first century Judaism, it, it, it was a supernatural worldview. And was that just for that time? Well, we've got to begin to confront that in us that I believe that Jesus actually modeled something that was for all time, for all disciples to walk into. So the New Testament uh, begins to unpack some of how this looked for that first century Judaism. It's called the age to come. And so there's this idea that Jesus came as the fulfillment of King David, that they were waiting for a Davidic king that would come and put the worlds to rights. Uh, there was a promise that somebody would sit on the, the throne of David and they were going to come and uh, bring the dominion of the kingdom of God to earth. So when we're talking about this kingdom of God and the, the gospel of the kingdom, this is not a philosophical message or a message about personal salvation. This, the people who heard this in the first century thought, this is going to fix everything. He, this guy is coming to fix everything in the earth, right? And so that age to come, the, the future age to come that they were waiting for of this, this king like King David, it came in Jesus, but it came unexpectedly in part, but not in full. So we see uh, that, that the age to come has come into this age. It's come upon this age, so-called age. So you can check out this uh, uh, graphic here in figure A that I'm putting on the screen. Uh, and that's why Paul describes Christians as those on whom the end of the ages has come in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. This is why Peter, after witnessing the outpouring of the Spirit, adds the words in the last days in Acts 2.17. Um, it's in direct quotation of Joel 2.28, uh, through 32. And so th this idea is pointing to the fact that there is a, an age to come and that we have begun to walk into the last days, quote unquote, that began with this return of the Davidic king uh, in Jesus. But this, this, king, this kingdom came in Jesus in an unexpected way. It didn't come uh, fully manifest now, but it came in part and some of it was yet future. And so there's a, a term that was coined by a guy named George Eldon Ladd, a theologian. He wrote a book called The Gospel of the Kingdom. Highly recommend you check it out. Um, and that term is the already but not yet. So parts of this future kingdom have begun to invade now and parts of it are still not yet. And so we walk in what's called a tension. Um, and so what does this all mean for signs and wonders? It means that we are walking in a tension in what this looks like for the kingdom of God, the future kingdom of God coming into the now. So the kingdom of God, or sorry, the signs and wonders, uh, where does that fit into this framework or this worldview of a kingdom worldview? Um, they are the evidence of an empowered church. God has empowered his church. Uh, the church can and is called to walk in demonstration of the kingdom in power. And we will see all of that come in the fullness in the future. But right now, 
uh, we see those signs and wonders. And by signs and wonders, what do I mean by that? Well, Acts 2.22 unpacks uh, this idea as Peter's preaching. He says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. So the works performed by Jesus in his earthly ministry, that's how we can understand when we're using this phrase signs and wonders, which is a biblical term, not something that we're coming up with. Uh, it's defined here as the works that Jesus did in demonstrating the reality of this kingdom. So uh, words and works of Jesus, they mark the beginning of the future kingdom that is uh, the age to come that is coming into the now. So uh, we see some expressions of this demonic deliverance. It points to the invasion of Satan's realm into the now that we live in that. Uh, but uh, when we begin to see demonic deliverance, we see uh, this points to the final destruction of Satan and that a church has power over him now. We are fully empowered over him now. Uh, so he may win some battles. We win the war. And we just, our job is to just keep praying. So um, healing, it, it bears witness to the end of suffering that is God's design at the end of the age. Um, and we can see bits of that now. Our job is to demonstrate and pray and God uh, will bring healing. He does bring healing to demonstrate the reality of that. So the future is invading the present is what we're saying. But even in, in doing that, <laughs> even in pursuing that, we have to live in attention. And so we live in that box that you see on your screen if you're watching this uh, on YouTube. And the already but not yet is the in-between space between the age to come and this age. Some of it has come into now. Uh, we're still uh, contending with, I guess is a word I'll use, with uh, this age and the ruler of this age, quote unquote Satan. But he is a defeated foe. He has no power. And so uh, the, 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 with the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, he's a defeated foe. But uh, he still can run around like a roaring lion and uh, shake, uh, shake chains and try to scare us and make us think that he's still got power, but he is a defeated foe. So the job of the church is to pray and demonstrate uh, the kingdom that is future, but is invading the present now. So this uh, is attention again, and, I, and, and to even talk about this, I know there's a stigma and part of that is because uh, it's, it's uncomfortable to pursue this. In fact, it was uncomfortable for Jesus. He prays for Lazarus to be raised from the dead, but we have no reason to believe that Lazarus didn't die again. So that's uncomfortable. That's uncomfortable to pray for people and even people to be raised from the dead who then die again, a natural death, and they'll be raised with Christ. But in the meantime, that's an uncomfortable thing to, to, to pursue because it means that we've got to live in that tension daily as we pray, okay? And so the message and the demonstration are inseparable if we are to fully proclaim the kingdom, which I believe is what we're called to do there in Matthew 24, 14. So this doesn't mean that you're wrong if you don't see signs and wonders uh, happen when you are proclaiming and praying, but it does mean that they're correlated. It does mean that those things got to go together. Um, they did in the book of Acts. They did uh, in the gospels and one reinforces the other. And so uh, as Mark 16 puts it in 16 verse 17, uh, these signs tend to follow those that believe. So uh, it's our job to pray, it's our job to pursue these. And so uh, how can we make space to eagerly desire the spiritual gifts as 1 Corinthians 14 puts it, and have these demonstrations begin to happen in our own life? How do we go after this ministry so that we can make space for the gospel of the kingdom to be preached to all nations that sets up the conditions uh, for the end and the, the return of Christ. So hopefully that's been helpful for you as a real brief introduction. And I realize that's a very brief introduction. Um, I want to point you to this book that I mentioned in this video, The Gospel of the Kingdom by George Eldon Ladd. It's an older uh, book on the kingdom of God, but it really has been instrumental in uh, changing the, the worldview of many in the West to thinking in terms of the kingdom. There's a lot of other books you can get out there, but I would recommend The Gospel of the Kingdom by Ladd. Again, hopefully this has been helpful for you. If it has, I uh, would love to hear from you in the comments, share your thoughts, uh, any questions you might have, and we'll keep talking about it. Bless you guys. See you next time.